Dear students, welcome back to our course on industrial organization. Last week we discussed at some length more sophisticated pricing strategies of a monopolist. We analyzed what is called third degree price discrimination or group pricing. We saw that if a monopolist is able to identify groups with different demand functions, this was a so-called identification problem, and it's also able to prevent arbitrage between these groups, these monopolists will uh, charge different prices according to the so-called inverse elasticity rules. So consumers with inelastic demand will have to pay a high price, consumers with elastic demand will get a better deal and pay a lower price. Even though different consumer types ended up paying different prices, all faced a so-called linear price. So that's where this uh, section headline comes from. Irrespective of the number of units they consumed, they paid the same per unit price. Today we will look into what is called nonlinear pricing. You will see that here the per unit price typically depends on the number of units consumed. So what we observe is called quantity discounting. So let's see and look into the details here. The, we want to start with here with uh, what is called first degree price discrimination or personalized pricing or uh, perfect price discrimination. This is an extreme form of price discrimination. Why? The point is here, in this case, the seller is able to extract the entire consumer surplus and the price is equal to the willingness to pay for each unit sold. Just to give you an example, suppose that you own five antique cars. So this is an example again from Pebble Richards Norman from our textbook. And suppose you have these uh, five antique cars and you meet several collectors and they have these different collectors have different uh, willingnesses to pay. So the keenest, keenest is willing uh, up to pay $10,000 per car. The second keenest up to eight, third, eight, six, and so on until down to two. Now, if you have enough information, if you know the willingness to pay from each of these uh, potential buyers, you can sell the car to each buyer according to her willingness to pay. Your revenue will simply be, okay, just uh, add this up, 10 plus 8 plus 6 plus 4 plus 2 should give you a total revenue of 30,000. Whereas the revenue with uniform monopoly only gives you 6,000 because yeah, you have to charge everyone the same price. So if you want to sell only one unit, you can charge a price of 10,000. If you want to sell three units, you charge a price of 6,000 and 6,000 would be three times 6,000 would be 18,000, which is better than two times uh, 8,000 or four times uh, 4,000. Okay, so you would sell three units. Of course, this would be inefficient, whereas uh, this case in which you have perfect or uh, first degree price discrimination would be efficient because you sell all your five cores. Note that this uh, first degree price discrimination requires even more uh, in, in terms of personalized pricing. It not only requires that every different, every customer has to pay its own price, it only requires that you pay a different price if you consume several units for each of these units. Okay, and that's what we want to look into now before, of course, this is highly uh, profitable, but uh, it requires, of course, detailed information. Will every uh, of these consumer come with a, uh, some, some note on his head saying what his or her willingness to pay is, okay? Uh, ability to avoid arbitrage, of course, is also a, a prerequisite to do that. And of course, that's what I already told you, it will lead to the efficient choice of output because you sell everything where the price is higher than the marginal cost and price will equal marginal cost here, marginal revenue will be equal marginal cost. But what is clear here, typically uh, it will be insurmountable to get all this information. Uh, typically, uh, and that's what we will get back to later, uh, consumers don't have an incentive to tell you truthfully what their real willingness to pay is. No arbitrage is typically less restrictive because if you know any way, anything about these consumers, you typically would also be able to prevent arbitrage. But the interesting thing is, and that's what I'm going to show you, there are pricing schemes that will achieve this output we have 
in first degree price discrimination where we know the willingness to pay of each consumer. And these uh, pricing schemes typically exhibit nonlinear prices and a particular uh, example here is what is called two-part pricing. As again, you will see in a minute that these are nonlinear prices because the more you consume, the lower is your per unit price. So that's what I want to do right now. I want to look into this case of uh, two-part pricing and I want to show you that it can extract all consumer surplus and therefore uh, secure an efficient output quantity. We will have no dead weight loss. So we will have the same result as we have in this previous case where we know every detail of the consumer. Okay. Uh, and the point is here, even in this example, uh, we have the case where each consumer's demand depends on the price of the good. So if the price is lower, each consumer will consume more. Okay, and our example is here a jazz club, or if you uh, have downloaded the notes, I added an Irish pub, okay, because it's then clear we have n identical consumers, of course, that makes life for our monopolist or for our pub uh, owner uh, easier. Each consumer has the same uh, demand function, or that is the same utility function, a simple linear demand curve with a maximum willingness to pay off V, and of course, but this is representative because all consumers are alike. And here, uh, this is then uh, the, the individual demand for drinks. So the quantity is the number of drinks, the number of Guinness you drink in this, in this pub. And here you have the inverse demand function. Uh, again, I added here that the cost function, of course, depends on uh, the total, uh, total output or total demand as the, the capital Q denotes a single demand and we have n consumers, total output will simply be, be n times this. And uh, of course, it has to be added here as well. It doesn't, enter, uh, it doesn't change anything. Okay, so cost is a standard uh, fixed cost plus some constant marginal cost. Marginal revenue per consumer is then just here uh, uh, in, in the diagram uh, curve with double the slope of the demand curve. Standard thing here, uh, yeah, double the slope of the demand curve. If we uh, look into marginal revenue for all consumers, we just would add an N here. It would just be N times this here. Okay, same thing. Marginal cost uh, related to one consumer is C, related to N consumers would be just N times C. Okay, And what you see is if you uh, equate uh, for N consumers, it would be N times C. Okay, And if you equate this marginal revenue with the marginal cost, you see the N just uh, cancels out. Okay, now what we can of course immediately do and what is done on the next on the next slide is just calculate the standard monopoly price where we have marginal revenue equal marginal cost. This is a so-called uniform price because everyone pays the same and also for the same for each unit consumed. And uh, of course, that's a straightforward maximization problem. We get standard uh, result here. We get that a price is just Typically, that would be called A plus C over 2, but here the vertical intercept is not A plus, plus uh, uh, but, but uh, V. So our price is V plus C over 2. Uh, the uh, monopoly profit is then V minus C over 2 squared over 4 times the number of consumers we have minus the fixed cost. So the standard result here and I don't need to go into this detail. The point is here, of course, that this kind of pricing strategy, the standard monopoly price, leaves this red triangle for the consumers in terms of consumer surplus. Okay, And of course, if you think in terms of pricing, uh, that doesn't seem like a very sophisticated pricing strategy. The question is, could the seller do better? And it's obvious here that if you see this, this uh, red triangle, that the seller could be better. Namely, remember, this was our Irish pub. Just uh, the seller could just uh, uh, introduce some entry fee. Okay, You have to charge if you wanted uh, the pub, uh, changing nothing. 
uh, that is ch uh, still keep your price of the of the Guinness very high, but charging an entry fee, of course, it's clear what is the maximum entry fee you can charge is just equal to this red triangle, which would be just V minus C squared over it. Okay, and that, that's what you can do. And of course, that's a good thing already. If you were a consultant, you would earn something uh, because this is worthwhile. Your, your pub owner would have been able to uh, increase its profit. But of course, is that the best you can do? And of course, it's not because you see very bad thing here, your dead weight loss. And your dead weight loss is also bad from the viewpoint of your pub owner because that means uh, he could sell more beer, he could, or she, uh, could sell more beer and could increase then the, the consumer's surplus. And of course, it could extract this consum additional consumer surplus by means of uh, a higher entry charge. So, uh, yeah, th that's what's written here. The maximum entry fee that each consumer will be willing to pay is its consumer surplus. And uh, so you can uh, increase your profit by uh, charging this entry fee. But of course, and that's now our next thing, what is the best uh, the seller can do? And now this should be immediately clear from our previous example. The bad thing is a dead weight loss. So if you're able to reduce this bad dead weight loss or to get rid of the dead weight loss, you will maximize the consumer surplus. And therefore, you will also be able to maximize uh, the entry fee you can charge. So what you are doing is just set the unit price equal to marginal cost. So you be, Guinness is very cheap. People drink, uh, or your, your uh, bar uh, visitors drink a lot of beer. We get a very high consumer surplus, this field, and you can increase uh, the entry fee and get a very high uh, profit. Remember, I don't know, we didn't have the, the previous monopoly profit, but it was about, oh, uh, bad color here. Or you should use a different color. Uh, the previous profit was something like this here. Okay, so uh, you oh, must be larger because it's where marginal revenue is equal marginal cost. So you see exactly uh, by the amount of the original dead weight loss, you can increase your profit. And what do you see here? Very nice result. You have perfect price discrimination. You have an efficient uh, uh, quantity, and uh, you as a firm. So efficient from the viewpoint of social planner of total welfare, and you as a firm extracted all these consumer surplus from the firm, uh, from, from the consumers. So that that's uh, what we already have. We really have an entry charge that converts all consumer surplus into profit, and uh, using this two-part pricing increases the monopolist profit. It even gives the maximum possible profit. So what we really have is personal uh, the result from uh, first degree price discrimination from personal pricing, personalized pricing. Okay, so th these two part pricing is a wonderful thing. So here we summarize this once again. Uh, this first degree price discrimination through two part pricing increases the profit by extracting all consumer surplus. It leads to unit price equal to marginal cost, and uh, it leads to an efficient output level. Okay, uh, the the problem is of course this was somehow a rather simple example because all consumers were alike. And suppose here consumers are not alike. You have different types, but you can distinguish these different types by age, by location, by some other distinguishing observable characteristics. So in terms of the Irish pub, uh, you can distinguish between students and professors and you just require from the student a student ID. So you're able to discriminate between the two. Age discrimination is typically more complicated, but uh, here you might have uh, different uh, distinguishing characteristics. And then we can extend our example and uh, look into, so you see again, it's discriminatory here from Pepper, Richard Norman, older and younger, so students and professors. Uh, and uh, what is clear, the older people, the professors have a higher willingness to pay. Uh, that means they drink, at least they have more money, perhaps they're also uh, drinking more Guinness. 
uh, I think uh, Pepper Richards Norman in a later edition changed this example to to ski riding uh, on on a ski lift. Okay, uh, and and uh, yeah. Anyway, so we 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 stick with the with the beer here, uh, and assume we that we have some constant marginal cost of four different willingness to pay, and of course it's immediately clear what we are doing. Uh, with price equal marginal cost, uh, the older consumers will consume 12 units uh, and uh, younger consumers will consume 8 units and you get a consumer surplus of 72 uh, for the older consumers and of 32 for the younger consumers, standard, standard uh, triangle area uh, to be calculated here. And what you are doing is that you now have two different groups and you still implement personalized pricing, you still implement first degree price discrimination because you can distinguish between these two different types and you charge two different entry fees. Okay, that's an important point. Of course, in the next slide, we will discuss uh, what happens if you have two different types but cannot distinguish uh, between the two types. You can identify two types, but you don't know who is who. Uh, and this converts all consumer surplus into profit, wonderful for the, for the monopolist. And uh, what we also could do is uh, rather than uh, selling the beer at, at the price of four uh, euros here and charging different entries fee, we could uh, do what is called block pricing. We offer all the com customers entry plus 12 units uh, at a fixed fee of 120. So this would be like a package. You get a package of uh, 12 of entry plus 12 units, and you have to pay 120. For the younger, you would, uh, you know, you, you, they have uh, to pay 32 plus 32 for eight units. That is 64. Same thing. But you will see later on uh, that might be an uh, uh, important difference where you have such packages or a two-part uh, tariff. Okay. Hopefully this should be clear what was rather straightforward. The point is here, however, uh, what if the seller cannot distinguish between the, the buyers? So uh, perhaps they differ in income. Uh, of course, I wouldn't go if uh, it's not possible because most of the of the of the of the uh, of the people who attend this Irish pub are just not uh, students and you don't know whether they have a high income or a low income. And typically, of course, I would also wear some old trousers or something like that, an old pair of jeans so that you cannot say, oh, this is a professor who certainly has a high willingness to pay. And if you cannot uh, distinguish between them, of course, your life is much more complicated. Uh, then this type of price discrimination is impossible. Okay, because that's what, what always happen, uh, cheating happens. High income buyers will pretend to be a low income buyer in order to avoid the high entry price and to pay the smaller total charge. Okay, again, we can just look into the incentive we have here uh, by means of our diagram. So we have high demand consumers and low demand consumers. Note that previously it was called old and young, but here we now can cannot distinguish between them. And the point is here, if the high demand consumer buys uh, in a sense uh, or claims to be a low demand consumer, uh, he will just say he's a low, uh, low demand or low income consumer uh, and he will uh, also have this these price of 4, the entry charge of 32, okay, will consume 12, 12 uh, units and have a really nice... Uh, consumer surplus of, of 40, okay? Of course, uh, you might think, uh, okay, I know now that this is really a high demand consumer because at a price of four, uh, she, consumes, she consumes 12 units. So could uh, the seller uh, prevent uh, this here by just limiting the number of units that can be bought. Remember, it could just do something as the block pricing that's selling this pa package previously. But even if uh, the, the, the seller uh, only, or our pub owner only uh, would sell this package at a price of uh, 64 with entry and, and eight units, of course then, I'd hope that this is now uh, clear here, 
uh, with NG and 8 units, it still would get the 32. And it still, of course, would not say I'm this high type because if uh, this guy reveals that she, he or she is, is a high type, it will get or it will end up with a, a consumer surplus of zero. Okay? So here, uh, that, that's the problem. So the seller has to compromise. And that's then really what we do under second degree price discrimination. We need a pricing stream, a uh, pricing scheme that uh, makes the buyers to reveal their true types. You will see in a minute that this is just our incentive compatibility constraint, uh, which uh, people or students who took the economics of regulation course uh, in the last semester will be very familiar with. Okay, so we want that each consumer reveals uh, his or her uh, true type and then self-selects the quantity price package designed for them. Okay, now you cannot say you have to buy this or you have to buy that or you only get this or you uh, get that. You offer two different packages and they uh, should self-select. And this is the essence of second degree price discrimination. It's like first degree price discrimination. The seller knows that there are two different types or several different types, but the seller is not able to say, you consumer, you are that type or that type. So it's not able to identify the different types. So they need to uh, reveal their own types. And a two-part tariff with different fixed fees, of course, is ineffective because if you say everyone uh, pays four euro per Guinness, uh, but uh, you uh, one one group has to pay the the, the rich guys have to pay uh, 64 as in entrance and the other is 32, then of course uh, everyone will say I'm uh, the poor guy and want only to pay 32. And what we have here, uh, as you will see, is quantity discounting, that is a lower per unit price for consumers who buy a higher quantity. Uh, yeah, that's what we have here. Uh, what, what are we doing here? Uh, of course, uh, again, assume that we have this package. We offer the low demand consumer a package of entry plus eight rings for 64. Okay. And uh, what that means, uh, so so the low demand consumers will be able to or will be willing to buy this this package and will be left with with a zero uh, co consumer surplus. But what happens with uh, the high demand consumer? Given that this package is available, the the high demand consumer can of course go for this package, will then buy eight units, will pay this sixty four. Uh, price of the package and will be left with 32 of consumer surplus. So if you want to offer a second package to these high demand consumers, which these high demand consumers are willing uh, to, to buy, you, this package has to give these high demand consumers at least uh, a consumer surplus of, of uh, 32. But here you already with this 8 you see, oh this might give you uh, uh, some profit if you're able to do that. And that is you will offer them a package which includes 12. So any other package offered to high demand consumers must offer at least a 32 consumer surplus. That's what I told you. This is, ah, that's important. That's what I already told you. This is an incentive compatibility constraint. Only if you are at least as good off uh, if uh, uh, from telling the truth, then if they cheat, they will tell the truth. That's our rather negative or cynical assumption we typically have. We just assume that if consumers benefit by cheating, they will cheat. So, and that's what I already told you. The high demand consumers are willing to pay uh, the total consumer surplus if they uh, buy 12 units is 120. Okay, for entry plus. Uh, uh, 12 drinks and uh, however you have to give them at least 32 in terms of consumer surplus so you can sell sell this this uh, this package at a price of 120 minus 32 which is 88 so if you offer the high demand consumers a package with entry and 12 units at a price of 88 we will choose this or be indifferent between that uh, a package and the other package, but we always assume that they then uh, take the one 
uh, which is designed for them. Okay, so that, that's what you are doing. And of course, and that's I think one of the, the final points here, uh, the, of course, low consumers will not buy the, the, this package because they are most willing to pay 32 for, for 12. And uh, the, the nice thing is, why should you do this as, as, your, as a pub owner? Yeah, you are able to increase uh, your profit. Uh, to to uh, from from the 32 you would have if you sell only the one package and you if you do not uh, care for the incentive compatibility constraint you can increase your profit by by uh, eight that's a good thing you get the same profit from the low demand consumer and what is interesting here you have quantity discounting because you this guy now gets the high type gets now. Uh, 12 units at a price of 88 and uh, 12 uh, or 88 divided by 12 gives probably 733 which is at least uh, uh, in any case uh, lower than uh, a price of 8 because 12 times 8 would be 96. Okay, so they pay less than the low demand consumers, this high demand consumers per unit. Important point however, this now already looks good in, in some sense, but uh, what is bad is still the 32, okay? 32 is still a very high consumer surplus these high demand consumers are left with. And that's what we want to change. That's uh, where we want to look whether we can improve further on that. And uh, before I go to the details, I just want to spend some time on the incentive compatibility constraint because that's, though it's so important here, what does it say? It actually says any offer made to high demand consumers must offer them as much consumer surplus as they would get from an offer designed for low demand consumers. Okay, that, that's rather straightforward because typically this is not a very moral decision. You go there, you go to the pub and they offer you two different packages and uh, you just take the one of the two. You don't have to, to explain why you are, are rich or why you're not rich and so on. So it's rather straightforward that you would always only uh, choose the one uh, package which gives you a higher a higher consumer surplus and therefore it's clear that if you're a high demand consumer you must be at least as well off with the the bundle or package designed for you than with the, the, the offer designed for the low demand consumers. And uh, what we have here is that this is a very common phenomenon and we have several examples here and remember economics of regulation or of those who did not yet uh, take this course you're welcome to take it in the next summer term, uh, where we have many instances looked into uh, the, the incentive compatibility constraint uh, in, in the, uh, in the uh, economics of regulation course, we had an adverse selection part where firms had private information about their costs. They have private information about their cost. The regulator didn't know whether they have high cost or low cost. And what happened then is that we have uh, had to, to give what is called the, the, the firm of information rent if it was a low cost firm in order uh, for it to truthfully re reveal that it has really low cost and therefore that the price uh, the regulator can set can be a low price. Okay, uh, that uh, was uh, the so-called information rent we had. In terms of this example here with the performance bonus, performance bonuses must encourage effort. So you only receive a bonus if you perform better, uh, but then you actually receive this bonus. Bonus. That's what we discussed under the 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 the, the headline of moral hazard in in economics of regulation. Uh, we wanted that managers uh, really work hard, and of course they only receive then the bonus if their, their performance was better. Uh, similar, the insurance market is in a sense a prototype market for adverse selection and, and moral hazard problems. Firms must not make it too easy for people who drive like hell to receive full coverage. So they, you have to pay typically large deductibles in order yeah, to deter cheating or in, in order to deter uh, careless driving. Okay. 
similar here the statement about peace rates in, in, in factories have to be accompanied by strict uh, quality inspections. That might remind you, if you took the economics of regulation course, of what we did under the headline of price cap regulation. In price cap regulation, firms are only allowed to charge a certain price. And if they're able to reduce their cost, they get a profit. Okay. The point is an easy way to reduce cost is to reduce quality. And in that respect, banks, uh, res uh, respect uh, typically this price cap regulation is also accompanied by some quality regulation. And that's what you exactly have here. Peace rates means just you get paid on your output in these factories, but uh, your output is not worth a lot if uh, if you have a lot of, oh, in German it's called Ausschuss, uh, of fail failed parts or bad parts. Okay. Uh, and the, the final thing, encouragement to buy in bulk must offer a price discount. This is exactly our topic here. Okay, so that uh, should be should be clear. Now, what we want to look into now, what is the best a club owner can do? Remember what we had previously was the 32. Was this uh, consumer surplus which was left at, at, at 32. And now we look how we could reduce it 32 further. And the idea here is to reduce the number of units offered to each low demand consumers. Now, suppose we offer seven instead of eight drinks. Uh, what that means is now the total willingness to pay of 59 uh, is, is then uh, 59.50 for these seven units. Actually, this 59.50 or this, this is probably a green area here is what is called GCS, the gross consumer surplus. We will get back to that later. Gross consumer surplus is just the whole area below, below the, the uh, demand curve. Okay. And now what you see here, profit is reduced, but only a very little by the small triangle here. Okay. It's just a reduction of 50 cents per consumer. So you hardly lose anything from changing uh, this uh, offer towards the low demand type. But does it help you in terms of the high demand type? Yeah, that's exactly what we are doing here because in terms of the low type, it's only a marginal change. But in terms of the high type, what you hopefully see, and which is not even shown here nicely, if we go here to the eight, you see, this is quite a, a large area which uh, is reduced here. It's an inframarginal change here for the high type. And uh, what we see here is, by this policy, uh, we can, uh, so we, we get a lower consumer surplus uh, and you have a willingness to pay of 87.5. And uh, so the consumer surplus is reduced by four units. Remember up there it was 32, now it's 28. Uh, compared to the 50 cent you lose here, it's rather good because for each 50 cent you lose here, you gain in a sense a $4 uh, here, okay? So you can now increase uh, the, the entry plus 12 drinks bundle or package to $92. And this increase your, your, uh, uh, your profit per consumer by $4. Here you lost 50 cents, so this sounds like, like a good idea, okay? I will qualify this later, but uh, you see now, not so nice. You still pay an information rent. You still have to leave some, some consumer surplus on the table for the high type, but uh, at least you, you were able to reduce it. So the monopolist does better by reducing the number of units offered to the low demand consumers, since this allows him or her to increase the charge to high demand consumers. Uh, what in, in, in general terms here, uh, what you are doing, and I think that's what, I, uh, what is written here on the next slide anyway, what you are doing is, uh, oh, that's in the next but one slide. What you are doing is you reduce uh, the, the output or the offer to the low type in order to decrease the, the, the information rent, the, the, the consumer surplus of the high type. So you distort here. But you, of course, you give the high type uh, uh, still the, the optimal bundle in the sense that uh, the high type still gets the 12 units. Uh, what, what is not clear or what might come up uh, previously is here. So here you uh, 
give something away which you get here. So from the, you get less from the low type, more from the high type. The question is, will you want to serve both types at all? Remember our discussion in, 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 uh, third degree price discrimination where we saw it might be the, the case that you do not, uh, serve one of the two markets at all. Okay. And here the question is, will you uh, really want to, to serve both types at all? Okay. I just need to check what, yeah. Uh, because if you serve only the high type, you don't make an offer for the low type. Of course, you could charge them the low type. You could sell uh, entry at a price, uh, an entry and, and a bundle of 12 at, yeah, so the whole area below that, that was our 120. Okay. And that, that's what we, what we want to know now. So will you want to supply both types? Because there are many cases in which Uh, companies or restaurants or country and golf clubs serve only the high demand types. And uh, if we take our example again, what we will see is it's key how many low type or low income consumers you have and what is the share of high demand consumers. And if you see if you have too many high demand consumers or if you have, if you have many, you will only serve the high types. That's what you will see here. So suppose both types of consumers are served. And then uh, in this case, we have just the two, two bundles, two packages are offered. This was this 59.5 at 7 and 92 uh, uh, 12 units aimed at high demand consumers. Uh, the profit is what we had, just, just uh, profit from a low demand consumer, $31.50 uh, times the number of low type consumers and uh, the, the number of high type consumers times the 44 you get. And what I just showed you is that if you only serve the high type consumers, you can sell it at a, a package of, of $120 for entry plus these 12 uh, units or 12 Guinness or whatever. Uh, and the profit per consumer is then this 72. And now we can easily calculate uh, where it's a good thing to serve both types. And it's only a good thing to serve both types if the profit here from serving both types is higher than the profit from serving only the high type. Uh, just solve this for, for NH. And what you will see is here, delete that, is that it holds only if the share of the high type consumers is not too high. It can be slightly higher than, than, than the, so the number of high type consumers can be slightly higher than the number of low type consumers. Uh, remember here, th this would just mean that you only have, uh, serve half of the consumers you previously had if you uh, serve only the, 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 the high type. So if it's not too high, you will serve both types. But if the share of the high type consumers is very high, given this difference in profit, you will only serve uh, the high types. And that's then our, resu uh, our result we have. And that's similar to this case in a third degree uh, price discrimination. Okay, so there should not be uh, uh, too high a proportion of high demand consumers. So what, what we have here is, and what we can sum up is these characteristics of second degree price discrimination. Uh, it extracts all consumer surplus from this low type, from the lowest demand curves, and leaves some consumer surplus. We had only one other groups, but if we had several uh, different types, it would leave to some consumer surplus to all other groups than the lowest demand curve. This is just what is called the incentive compatibility constraint because all these people with a higher willingness to pay could always claim to be the, the lowest type. Okay. And what we are doing is that we distort the decision of the lowest type in that sense that we offer them a lower than the socially efficient quantity. And we do that for all groups, not only the lowest type, but all groups other than the highest type. So this is what I won't show you, but what you uh, can see, for instance, or can read uh, in, in a Tyrol textbook. And what we also saw is that we, we offer quantity discounting. So what we are doing 
is we leave some consumer surplus on the table. And therefore, the second degree price discrimination converts consumer surplus also into profit, but less effectively, of course, than this first degree uh, price discrimination. We have to induce the high types to reveal their true type and consume the, the package design for them. And we can only to do that by giving them some uh, consumer surplus, some information rate. Okay? Yeah, before I, because that was now already something, before I move on with a slightly more formal analysis uh, of, of uh, second degree price discrimination, I just want to make a short uh, break here and want to ask for questions uh, in WebEx. Yeah, after having uh, shown you how to derive the second de degree price discrimination results by means of an example, I want to introduce a slightly more formal analysis of the second degree price discrimination. And what I want to do, I want to start with the case of a uniform two-part tariff. What does this mean? We have a uniform fixed fee and, of course, a uniform variable pricing compon component, but different consumer types. Remember, uh, once we had, uh, in a, uh, our very first example, was that we had two different types, but we could distinguish between professors and students, and so we were able uh, to, to charge different entry charges. Uh, and at the same same uh, unit price, which was four euro equal to, to or four dollar equal to marginal cost. Now we move on to the case where we have uh, a single unit fee and a single uniform, a single uh, uniform fixed fee and a single per unit charge. Okay, and uh, you will see what what's happening here. Uh, the example here I have in mind is something like a printer and a toner cartridge. Okay, so if you buy a printer, it has it, you have to pay for the for the printer device, and you have a per unit charge for each toner you buy. Okay, that would be the price. And now we assume that you have two groups of consumers uh, with different demand functions. They just have the same slope of minus one, but we have different maximum willingness to pay. The group one would be the people with the high willingness to pay. Uh, group two would be the people, uh, the, the people with the low will willingness to pay. Okay, so what is clear if we have only a single type, uh, what you will see is that uh, your printer would be sold at a very high price equal to the total willingness to pay or to the consumer surplus, which you obtain once you sell the toner cartridges at a price equal marginal uh, marginal cost. Okay, uh, that's really not what we observe in, in reality, because here we typically see that these toner cartridges are uh, awfully expensive, but at the same time, printers are very cheap or comparatively cheap in a sense. So what we will see or what we will look into, what happens if you can only charge this uh, single two-part tariff, okay, but if you have two different consumer groups. Now, again, our group size will matter. Again, the same question, will you want to sell your printer to both consumer groups at all? And the total number of consumers is just the sum of the individual numbers. And the ingredients are, first of all, the consumer surplus uh, for a given price P, uh, which is simply this triangle. So I don't need to, to do that once again. That was a 32 or whatever it was up there. So it's just the, the, the vertical intercept minus the price squared over 2. And the fixed fee will always be equal to the consumer surplus. That is, if... We have only one type, this fixed fee, of course, and if we serve both types, this fixed fee will be equal to the consumer surplus of the low type. I think that's what we have here with two types and both serve. The fee must be equal to the consumer with the low willingness to pay. That's what we just saw in our example. So it extracts only the rents if we have only one type. And this is what is called the participation constraint. Uh, in, in economics of regulation or only in this uh, type of, of, of models. Participation constraint is that you cannot, the, the firm or the, the consumer will only buy if it uh, has at least zero uh, consumer surplus. 
Again, the con uh, we assume that we have constant marginal cost C. Okay, so the case if both types are served, then it's rather straightforward that our fixed fee will be equal to here say two to the willingness to pay or excuse me to the to the consumer surplus of the high type. Again, here could just draw this here Q here P. This would be our our low type. This would be our A two. I think probably I have it in the next slide anyway. This would be our C. So if this is our price, this would above. If this is our price, this above here would just be our our fixed fee because this is equal to the consumer surplus. And now we can look into what the profit function of our firm now is. Uh, of course, here for the F, it, it receives n times the fixed fee and people buy the printer. And it sells also the toner. It sells it at a price P and A minus P is nothing else than individual demand of one high type or one consumer of type one times the number of these consumers, the same for, uh, for, for uh, firm two. And then uh, we didn't, here it's just uh, only the, 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 the price for the, uh, for the, uh, excuse me, the, the, the cost for the consumption week, in, if, in, if we would really take the, cons the, the example of the, of the printer, we would also have to add uh, n times the, the production cost for the printer. But this uh, would not change our results. Okay. What we are doing now, of course, as we can just substitute here for the F, and uh, for the, the fixed fee, and this fixed fee also depends on P, we just take the derivative with respect to P and get this here. Uh, rather straightforward to calculate that. We can solve that for P and get a very nice result. As always, you should check uh, my calculations, but or you will also have the opportunity to, uh, to, to do similar things in, in assignment and a tutorial class. And what is optimal price? Now, what we have now formally proven is actually our result that it's really optimal to charge a, a, a price equal marginal cost if you have only one type. Because if A1 is equal to A2, this expression here would be zero and price would be optimal or would be equal to C. So price is equal to marginal cost if you have only one type. The interesting thing, however, here is that if you have two types, where you have a type with a higher willingness to pay, you would increase increase uh, the, the, this per unit price. Okay, you would increase this per unit price, and the extent of the increase depends on the differences in this willingness to pay or in this maximum uh, vertical intercept of the demand curve A1, and it also depends on the number of high type consumers. So even, even if you have a high difference in the willingness to pay, it's if only one in a million consumers has this high willingness to pay, you will still have a price close to, to marginal cost. Okay, but the point is here, once you have two different types and can only set a single a two part tariff with a single a fixed fee and a single price per, per unit charge, you will uh, really uh, deviate from price equal marginal cost. Okay, and that's similar to what we have above. You will see you distort the decision, and I, you will see that also in a diagram on the, on the next uh, slide. Uh, good. Here, uh, what what I depicted here is just a profit. What you see here, this is just a profit if you would sell at price equal marginal cost and uh, sell or serve everyone, okay, then you would just have uh, this consumer surplus in the case of price equal marginal cost for consumer two. Uh, what is also clear, and, and that's what you get in addition once you, uh, you uh, are able to increase uh, or once you increase upward the price uh, for, for the per unit charge, okay. Of course, again, uh, we, we should compare uh, this with the situation in which you only serve the high type. Uh, the, the profit then would be the same as this thing here, just you would have an A1 here, because of course you would sell, if you serve only one type, you sell, uh, serve uh, or sell at the price or a unit charge equal to marginal cost and then a fixed fee uh, equal to the 
consumption surplus, consumer surplus of the high type. And of course, then you just compare the two and uh, calculate it. Uh, it, it it's straightforward. Uh, and and yeah, you just compare it and you get a similar result as we had in the in the example above. Okay, and I think you will have uh, uh, in the assignment anyway such a such a question. It of course what is clear uh, whether you serve both types depends again on this n1 on what is the share of the high types and what the difference in the willingness to pay between the two is. I just want to illustrate that in, in, in terms of this diagram here. So what we just have now, uh, and this is very similar to the example we had above, is that if we sell at price equal marginal cost, and if we serve both types, what, what we would get is just this consumer surplus, this, this triangle here. Okay, That's what we get. And, and n times from both the high type and the low type consumers. What we uh, can do now, how can we improve that by, and I make that then in a different color, how can we improve that by uh, distorting this decision? Yeah, for instance, uh, suppose we charge a higher price here. What happens then if we charge a higher price? We lose something in terms of this red triangle here from the low type okay because now the low type uh, still buys this uh, and uh, now however we get uh, only this whatever trapezoid or what that is here okay so we lose this uh, small red triangle from the low type but actually what do we get from the high type now the high type will consume less rather than it was something like 17 here it will only uh, they will only consume this much here the 15 or so but we don't even lose this small triangle because that's now paid by the high type in terms uh, of this uh, price for for the printer for the toner cartridges okay it has a to pay a higher per unit charge and you see uh, oh no i would even need a third color if that works you see now you really are able to increase your profit too much now your profit by this here okay and that's a good thing and now we have a rather interesting result uh, in the notes i state that the consumer surplus of the of the high type so uh, ah, I, uh, I wanted to do another thing here uh, what we see here, of course, uh, with, with the original uh, or with a price equal marginal cost, the consumer surplus, and now again, I uh, probably confuse it completely with a third color, the consumer surplus, I don't know whether you see this yellow, of the high type uh, would be equal to the full uh, triangle here. Uh, and and uh, given that it only had to pay the red uh, rectangle, the, the the consumer surplus of the low type, it would have gotten a rather high consumer surplus. Now, by increasing the per unit charge, you really reduce this uh, consumer surplus here. Okay. And so you make, uh, in a sense, the incentive compatibility constraint less binding. So the, it has no charge anyway, but you are able to reduce uh, the, the consumer surplus and you're able to increase the profit. And now I want to get, uh, get back to my printer and toner cartridges example. You certainly uh, cursed because you had to pay so much for, for the toner cartridges. Uh, once in a while I did that. How can these, uh, for, for the, these ink uh, oh, patrons, or how, how they call it in English, I don't know, Tinten Patronen, how can they be so expensive? Okay, uh, It's an interesting case because what we see here if we allow, uh, like a toner company like uh, Hewlett and Packard or, or Brothers or whatever it is, Lexmark, uh, if we allow them uh, to have a monopoly on the sales of their of their of their toner cartridges, what they will do is they will sell the toner cartridges at a price well above marginal cost. But that means that if they serve both types, uh, they will have a rather low price for the printer. And that's exactly what we observe. 
So the price of the printer will be low, but the price for the toner cartridges will be high. Okay? Uh, that's their price discrimination device in a sense. What would happen uh, if we, if we uh, forbid or if we allow entry here? Uh, if we say some, I think Pelican is uh, a producer of, of competing uh, toner cartridges. If we allow them uh, or if we allow a competitive entry here in this toner cartridges bus uh, business, it will lead to price equal marginal cost. And then, of course, if uh, the, 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 the uh, printer monopolists call them monopolists because Julian and Packard, for instance, only want to uh, sell certain uh, laser printers or whatever it is, okay. Uh, what will this monopolist do? Of course, now uh, it can either only sell to the, or at a, at a, at a rather, still rather low price equal to this uh, uh, triangle of consumer surplus of the low type. In this case, it would be exactly equal to 45. Uh, and not getting any profit from toner cartridges because there is this competitive toner business. Or it could sell it, and here the, the whole triangle of the, of the high type would be 144, or it can sell the, the, the printer at a very, very high price and only serve the high type. So you see here, if you forbid or if you make this kind of price discrimination impossible uh, here from, from the marginal costs, uh, and, and if you allow here competition or entry uh, by saying you, you have to admit that others, other companies uh, produce toner cartridges, you might end up with a very high price of, of printers and meaning that uh, people which just uh, want to, to, to print occasionally and don't have a high uh, demand for, for printing, they won't end up with a, with a, with a uh, buying a printer and we would of course have an inefficient situation. Hopefully uh, this this became clear. Uh, in order to confuse even further, I want to uh, make a final point here. What you see is here we compared our two-part uh, tariff with packages previously. So if we have this kind of two-part uh, tariff, what is bad about the two-part tariff is that if you have a per unit charge of five here, uh, the, 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 con the, the high type consumers still get a very, just erase it first and draw it then once again, the high type with a price of five and this, this, if this uh, uh, two-part tariff with a fixed fee equal to this, this would be the, the blue uh, triangle and uh, a per unit charge of five. It still would give uh, the high types rather high consumer surplus. Of course, and, and that's not nice. What you could do here is just introduce a package. You could introduce a package as we did previously and sell uh, something where you restrict the sales of the low package. So if you sell this package, you can only get a certain number of printer cartridges per year or something like that. Uh, restrict that and that would reduce your incentive compatibility constraint. So probably here the, the printer example is no longer perfect uh, because you can hardly restrict the sales of, of printer cartridges. Okay, but in a minute I will just show you uh, how this works with these packages and why these packages uh, work better in terms of uh, extracting consumer surplus. That's the next point here. So menu pricing with different consumers. So previously we had, a, oh, I just take a, a red color here, it looks nice. Uh, with different uh, consumers, so we optimize uh, or, or yeah, optimize here with linear demand. So what we are doing is we offer packages of a certain quantity for a total payment. Uh, sounds abstract, but it's exactly what all the mobile phone companies do. I just uh, made a screenshot of an offer of Deutsche Telekom here. You see they offer packages. You can get a package with six gigabyte uh, included uh, and you pay 
30 or 39 euros you can get 12 gigabyte you pay 10 euros more uh, you can get uh, 24 gigabyte tell another 10 you pay another 10 euros more or you can get an unlimited uh, tariff uh, no 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 data limit and you pay 82 and what you will see of course uh, again you get quantity discounting here but you do you see is you have packages okay you have the package which determines your, your price, your total payment for this package, 39 euros here, and it, tell, it determines the quantity. Okay. Of course, uh, we want to make life easier. We don't look for, for different uh, uh, tariff bundles. We just assume that we have two different types and we uh, tailor or design two different packages for them. Okay. Uh, so that's what we are doing. Again, we have the same consumer types as previously, a high type and a low type. And uh, again, the same group sizes, all the same as, as previously. Now the optimization problem is, uh, is different. It looks simpler because here what your profit is simply is number of uh, high type consumers times what they have to pay for the package minus the marginal cost. Uh, or, or the, the variable cost you have from serving this consumer seems ta uh, C times uh, the quantity and the same for these low type uh, consumers here. Uh, the, the ugly thing is here that you have to determine four different variables. Uh, the two prices of the packages, the tariffs, and you have to determine uh, the two quantities. And if you take a derivative here, it doesn't help you much. You have to take into account uh, certain constraints and what are the constraints and again you already know we have two different types of constraints which one is it it's a participation constraint you need to make sure that the low type really wants to buy and it's an incentive compatibility constraint you want to make sure that go back to our telecom that these high types uh, when really buy uh, the, the expensive bundle okay tailored for them that's what you want to make sure and that's what we are doing what are our constraints the first is a participation constraint what does that mean gross consumer surplus must uh, of the low valuation type must be lower than what you charge them uh, in 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 uh, terms of the diagram or or in terms of formal terms in this uh, is just this here uh, in order to make uh, that clear it's easiest to go to the next slide here uh, if you sell them a package uh, which oops uh, now I have to go back that was not so good if you sell them a package which includes five gigabyte uh, okay uh, the gross consumer surplus is just the area below below the the demand curve here the participation constraint then requires if you want to sell them this package with five gigabyte uh, you can charge at most this area and this area in terms of the previous slide is just this year okay this is uh, this would be uh, yeah, the, the triangle plus a rectangle Th that's what we have and that's what you get then okay so this is straightforward to calculate so this is your participation constraint what you get from uh, the the no valuation type the other second constraint is the incentive compatibility constraint the high valuation type must not have an incentive to, to, to choose the package designed for uh, the low demand type that is the consumer surplus of the high type must be higher if uh, she consumes the package tailored for uh, herself rather than she consumes a package tailored for uh, the, the low type and uh, Again, I think here that's what I can show again on a slide. So what, oh, wait, wait ah, that's, I wanted to go here. So that's uh, what I wanted to, to show you here. Uh, the package, now again, a different color. The package uh, you uh, give her has to give uh, this these high type a higher consumer surplus than if she buys this package with five gigabyte, uh, she has to pay uh, the, the red area in terms of T. That would be our T2, okay? Our 
price of the of the low package of the small package and it would of course get then this uh, in terms of consumer surplus and this trapezoid that's uh, what we just calculate uh, here in in this in the in the slide okay so it would give this and uh, then it's clear each package needs to give uh, it a consumer surplus like this of course it's again clear uh, if we offer uh, in a sense, this first best package here of 10 gigabyte, uh, or this undistorted package where we say price equal marginal cost to the low type, uh, then the low type would pay that much, uh, the red area here and, and the green area. Of course, this would give our, uh, our uh, high type a much higher consumer surplus. Again, probably too much in here. So you see, by reducing, by reducing the quantity of the low type, uh, and therefore, of course, the payment for the low type, you can decrease the consumer surplus. That's what we saw. Okay? Yeah, and uh, again, red as a color here. Uh, and, uh, of course, so you, I think you will have an example where you just compare uh, this... Uh, this would be our, uh, the area I just told you, the, the area above, oh, that was this area here, okay, the area here, this trapezoid up there, depending on uh, what, what the bundle is we, or the package we offer to the low type. And this must, of course, be uh, smaller or equal, actually it will always be equal, uh, because optimality requires that the constraints are binding. And uh, so, we can solve this then for t. So we, we solved this up here for t2. So we obtain t2 as a function of q, uh, q2 in this case. And we get then here t1 as a function, if we substitute t2, also of q1 and q2. Uh, or q2. Okay, so that's what we have. What we are doing now is just substitute that into the profit function. You always should check my results, okay? Never believe me, but check it. Uh, you will always have uh, a res uh, the chance to do that in, in terms of the assignments or the problems. Uh, what you have to do is just, given that you have substituted for the T1 and T2, you get an expression, the profit function in terms of Q1 and Q2. Do derive the first order conditions, take the derivative with respect to Q1 and Q2. And what you get is these quantities, uh, once you manipulate a little bit. And these quantities are very interesting. Why are they interesting? Because here you see Q1 was a, uh, type 1 was a high type. Type 1 gets price equal marginal cost, namely price equal to C, and the quantity is really a first best quantity. Type 2 gets a lower quantity. And uh, the deviation from, 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 from the first best, from the uh, price equal marginal cost quantity, depends on the difference between the willingnesses to pay and on the share of the high types to the low types. Okay? Th that's what we have here. Now, what you again see here is uh, what the profit is. Again, here, this would be the profit uh, if you uh, sell everyone at a price equal marginal cost. Here is what you get in addition if you restrict, if you get these packages. Okay, uh, th that's what you also see because, again, here, uh, this would be if you sell the low type at a price equal marginal cost, then uh, its quantity would simply be Q, uh, Q uh, equal to A2 minus, minus C, and that's actually just then uh, its, its uh, consumer surplus times N. So you see you always get something in addition to that, what you can always achieve. And what you get in addition depends on how much higher the willingness to pay of the high type is and what the share, what the share of the high type compared uh, to the low type is. So, what you already saw, high valuation consumer obtains the first best quantity. Now, we even proved it, even though only for the linear case, but we proved it formally, and it also gets a surplus. That's what we just saw. Uh, the low valuation type gets less than the first best and no surplus. That's what how we, de how we, we designed this, this package. 
and the deviation in quantity, that's what we saw, depends on the relative number of, of both types. And the profit is greater than with two-part tariff. Uh, you just could, uh, could uh, compare that. You will immediately see that with the low type, we had an N down here. So a higher, a higher uh, denominator. And uh, yeah. Yeah, anyway, so that's what you can get uh, uh, if you compare it. It would also, and that's what I added compared to the old slide deck I distributed, it holds all of, also for two-part pricing with different fixed fees and different per unit charges. Okay, uh, so, uh, and that, that's probably an interesting thing here. Going back to, to my screenshot, some, some say six or seven years ago, uh, uh, oh, I probably 15 or uh, uh, I was in Austria at that time and uh, their uh, tailoring was acquired by T-Mobile. At that time, many of the companies, uh, of the mobile phone companies offered a tariff where they had a fixed fee, fixed monthly fee of say, say uh, 20 euro plus uh, some, some per unit charge uh, price per minute was at that time. At that time, data was not so important by price per minute. And what they had is that they offered you a different fixed fees. Say if you paid a, a fixed a monthly fixed fee of, of 20 euro, uh, you uh, paid five uh, cent per minute. If you paid 50 euro, you got zero cent per minute or something like that. You got a real uh, uh, flat rate. Okay. The question is, what is smarter? Is the package smarter or is the, the different uh, fixed fees uh, and, and different uh, two-part tariffs smarter? Of course, it should be clear by now that it's smarter to have, uh, and that's what I tried to show you uh, in this completely complicated slide up here, I think. Uh, where I had the two-part tariff, you see with the two-part tariff, you don't restrict, you don't restrict uh, the, the, the quantity the high type gets uh, if, uh, if he chooses the wrong, the wrong kind of, of, of contract. If he chooses a contract with a, with a low fixed fee and, and a high per unit charge, it still can uh, consume a much higher quantity than the low type. That's what you what you uh, disable by choosing by choosing uh, uh, packages. This kind of menu pricing. Okay. So interestingly, some 15 years ago, you could observe different pricing uh, strategies by mobile uh, phone companies. At one time, then they really realized that it's better to offer these kind of packages rather than a set of two-part tariffs. And you should be able to, to calculate that. I think that's what I wanted to tell you here. Uh, the final slide here uh, goes back to, to welfare and to public policy. Uh, of course, we already discussed at some length that it's, it's not a good idea uh, to, to, to ban or to forbid price discrimination in terms of third degree price discrimination if it leads to the fact that a certain consumer group is no longer served. What you will see in terms of first and second de dis degree price discrimination, it's mostly in a sense a good thing at least uh, if it increases output compared to uniform pricing. And you will see in many cases that cases it increases output uh, in, in uh, terms uh, or compared to the uniform, to the standard monopoly price, and therefore uh, it would at least be uh, reducing the, the, the dead weight loss, and therefore it would uh, decrease uh, the it would decrease uh, dead weight loss and inefficiency. But the problem is, of course, distribution, because uh, it uh, typically also reduces. Consumer surplus. In that respect, you might think, okay, that's not a good idea. It increases uh, profits. It reduces inefficiency because the dead weight loss gets smaller. But uh, that is goes all at the expense of consumers. Okay, and uh, yeah, then it depends really 
uh, what, what uh, monopolists do with these profits in economics of innovation, we at some length discuss the importance of high profits as, as an incentive to innovate. So uh, if, it, uh, if these kind of pricing strategies allows the firms to extract higher profit and therefore gives them a higher uh, incentive to innovate, it's a good thing. If not, okay, it depends on your on how you value uh, or what, what you, in a sense, what your welfare function is, whether you uh, evaluate uh, profit as high as, as consumer surplus. What, is, what does policy do in terms of, of uh, second degree price discrimination or uh, price discrimination at all? In the US, you have the Robinson Patman Act, uh, which makes price discrimination illegal if it is intended. Uh, to create a monopoly. Uh, we have a similar discussion here in, in Germany or in, in Europe in terms of think of the, of the oil companies. These oil companies like Exxon uh, or, or British BP or Shell, they typically also uh, operate refineries. And so they are both at the same time upstream companies and, and, and downstream uh, competitors because they uh, sell their, the, the, the gasoline they produce there both to, to freie tankstellen, to some competitors, which are not part of some, some conglomerate or some, some, some uh, large company, and to their own subsidiaries. And the question is always, do they discriminate here uh, with respect that, or in, in that respect that they sell uh, at a lower wholesale price to their own subsidiaries than to the freie tankstellen, so to the competitors. So that, that's a discussion here. In terms of uh, 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 an excuse for, for discriminatory prices, uh, a typical one is meet the competition. Uh, so the competitors also discriminate or sell at a lower price to someone. You, I also want to do that. Uh, the point is here that in, in terms of our discussion in Germany, we also uh, get more like uh, the opposite. We get a discussion about what is called price parity clauses. Price parity clauses uh, gained a lot of uh, prominence uh, in, in the so-called booking case or HRS uh, case where uh, these companies, these uh, hotel online hotel booking platforms uh, uh, or travel agencies uh, required from the hotels which were active on their platform that they didn't sell their rooms at a lower price than it was offered on booking. This was a so-called price parity clause. Uh, this is a rather interesting and, and recent uh, development, uh, and uh, there have been, or there is currently an ongoing proceeding or, or case uh, which the Federal Cartel Office, the Bundeskartellamt, started against uh, booking. And I think there was a decision by the OLG, the Oberlandesgericht Düsseldorf, uh, which uh, was not clear. So it's still not uh, still ongoing. So uh, the, the 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 OLG Düsseldorf didn't forbid this. Uh, this practice, and here the discussion is about whether it's it's uh, wide or or narrow uh, parity clauses. So if you're more interested in that, uh, write a PhD, uh, not a PhD thesis. You can should start probably with a master thesis. Okay, you can do your master thesis on that. Rather interesting uh, point. So the the final point here is what about enforcement? Uh, Pepper Richard Norman state that enforcement has been spotty. That doesn't hold for Germany. Uh, the Bundeskartell and the Federal Cartel Office did several cases concerning, for instance, the so-called Doppelpreis system. What is that? This is dual tariffs. Uh, dual tariffs uh, in that respect that uh, companies, I think I already mentioned that, uh, if MediaMarkt sells uh, a washing machine from Bosch Siemens Hausgeräte, uh, they are charged a different price whether they sell it from their brick and mortar store or whether they sell it online. So they have to pay a different wholesale price to Bosch Siemens Hautgeräte. That was what is called a Doppelpreis system or dual tariff. I think the Bundeskartellamt or the Federal Cartel Office forbid this, uh, uh, this uh, kind of practice. Even though I think this is also debatable, again, a very interesting topic for a master thesis, what that means in terms of, of welfare and in particular what it means in terms of our brick and mortar stores, because 
uh, of course, this was done by the, uh, by the manufacturers in order to protect, in a sense, the brick and mortar stores. Uh, that, that's interesting. And the same thing happened with so-called uh, restrictions uh, of, of online sales. There was another case, Dornbracht, where you produce uh, bathroom fixtures, but it's a bit amateur. And uh, they restricted sales, they restricted online sales. Okay, They had to pay then some damages to a company called Reuter. Uh, I think, uh, again, a uh, rather uh, debatable decision. Uh, again, you saw that, so this was all discrimination. Okay, It was discrimination not uh, in terms of final customers, but in terms of the, of, the tra of the channel you had, of the sales channel. Of course, if you only buy online, uh, you had a problem because you couldn't get a certain, certain uh, products online. That also holds typically for, for some luxury products. You also have problems buying your Rolex uh, watch on, online. Uh, okay, in US uh, here, uh, the, the enforcement was much weaker. There is a pharmaceutical case to which Pepper Richard Normans here allude. This was a case in which pharmaceutical companies charged a higher price to drugstores than to institutional pharmacies and so-called health maintenance uh, uh, organizations. Okay, yeah, that's, that's what it is. Uh, what is interesting here uh, in, in, in Europe, we have a long-standing discussion of what is called uh, uh, discounts and there's a huge distinction distinction between what is called quantity discounts that's what we looked into and uh, loyalty or fidelity discounts there's a famous Michelin case I gave you the uh, no press uh, release from the decision of the European Court of Justice from 2003 or so and these loyalty uh, rebates are different from quantity discounts because they do not typically depend on a total uh, number of units you buy, but whether you bought 100% of all your your uh, requirements from a certain company or only 80%. So it depends on whether you only buy from this firm or also buy from competitors. And that's why it's uh, thought that this is intended to create a monopoly to, 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 to uh, in a sense, make life harder for, for competitors. There are some inter international cases also ongoing. Anti-dumping can be mentioned here because anti-dumping just means you sell at home cheaper than abroad. Uh, excuse me, you sell abroad cheaper than at home. And this is uh, strange in a sense because if you sell abroad, uh, like I think uh, Chinese companies in terms of solar panels were accused of, of dumping. Uh, and if you sell in Europe, of course, you would have higher transport costs. Uh, but perhaps the price elasticity is different. So you see a lot of interesting uh, topics here. And uh, move on to and, and go and, and look into the case in which we have, uh, in which we have, uh, or, or write a master thesis on it. Okay? In terms of price discrimination. Also very interested theoretically. I'm done with this part. Okay, next week we will move on uh, with, with uh, another kind of sophisticated uh, firm strategy. Now we move on from pricing strategies due to what is called product differentiation strategies. And uh, these product differentiation strategies might have uh, two different or, or, or have several aspects. The first aspect, uh, is aspect would be uh, do you want to sell different varieties of a product? Which quality do you want to choose for your product? Or do you offer certain quality? And if you sell several products, do you want to bundle them? Okay. Uh, I just want to very briefly start with this discussion uh, and mainly give you the idea so that you already get an idea for what you, look, uh, what, what you can look forward to. So a monopolist can offer different varieties of a product. Here you see why life for men is so hard. If you go to the supermarket and if you want to buy, for instance, a shampoo from Procter & Gamble, they sell these head and shoulders uh, for which uh, Bayern Munich uh, players uh, run commercials. Uh, you see you are uh, completely uh, overforded. So you, you, you run crazy because you don't know which to take. So the question is, of course, for the company, how many different varieties should it offer? 
and for the for the social planner of in terms of of, of total welfare is that optimal uh, the, the 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 number of of uh, of varieties we offer. If you're interested uh, in, in some entertainment in the slides or in the notes, I gave you the hyperlink to uh, uh, an episode of the Harold, Harald Schmidt show, uh, German, I don't know whether we would say comedian or late night host in, in former times. And he looked into uh, these product variety uh, on the occasion of, uh, I think Procter and Gamble took over Vela or something like that. Okay, and here what you see is you have multi-product firms and the question of course is how many different varieties of such a, a product would you, uh, would you want to consume? And of course what you do is you want to serve different types of consumer. So what you have here uh, in terms of head and shoulders is this dandruff shampoos and you have different uh, consumer types and Yeah, it depends on what type of hair they have. And so you offer products with different characteristics, but similar qualities. Another famous example in that respect is the different breakfast cereals Kellogg's offers. They have a very wide range. And if you go to a supermarket uh, uh, and, and look for the muesli, uh, look at uh, Seitenbacher muesli. They have tons of different types, Bergsteiger, Sonnen, Bauland, whatever this is. So... Just uh, look for these different types. And as a consumer, you always wonder, is that really optimal to have so much? We want to analyze it. I want to present you uh, a nice uh, spatial model in which we can analyze uh, this, this question over whether the number of varieties uh, uh, multi-product monopolists would typically offer is optimal from a social point of view. And finally, as I have a, a minute left here, uh, the other aspect is what is called vertical product differentiation. Here, our company uh, also produces different products, but these different products differ in quality. So consumers have similar attitudes towards quality. Uh, and uh, it's always so that consumers value higher quality more. So if you were to give the, the or sell the, the, Two different qualities at the same price, consumers would always go for the higher quality. And an example here is just, uh, I could also have taken Volkswagen or, or Mercedes, but I just took this from, from BMW because they had the prices in it. Uh, and you see they, they sell rather different series, the, one, the Series 1, Series 3, Series 5, Series 7. These are different cars. Everyone would say probably that Series One is a lower quality car than, than the Series Seven, and yeah, that's exactly what we have. Okay, that's in a sense vertical product differentiation. Okay, that's it. Uh, I want. Uh, I think I um, I'm going to stop here because before I start with a more. Uh, detailed discussion of the big issues. It will be pricing. It will be how many products, what, what product variety you want to produce, which qualities, that's exactly the question. And bundling we are going to look into only uh, next week. Yeah, that's for today. Hopefully you got some idea, perhaps even for, for a master thesis you might want to write. Uh, we now have spent some time on uh, sophisticated pricing strategies. And as you saw next week, we will discuss what is also called product proliferation. So you sell many different product varieties. I thank you for your participation. Again, I will be able for some more minutes in, in WebEx to have further discussion. Thank you and goodbye until next week. <laughs>